Good morning, CCF. There's revival and spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasted all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Won't you choose it? You can't lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's All right, good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing this morning? All right, we're doing good. That's good to hear. I heard a lot of goods. I like that. Man, welcome to Christ Community Fellowship. If it is your first time joining us this morning for worship, we are delighted that you are here. We hope you feel uh, at home this morning. And of course, if you have any questions about us as a church, uh, please come find me, come find Bobby, uh, Mr. Hobson back here. We'd be happy to answer any questions to the best of our ability that we can. And if you're tuning in with us on live stream, man, we're delighted that you're here tuning in with us from wherever you are uh, for worship as well. My name is Joey Colbert. I'm the student pastor here at CCF, and it is our mission, it's our vision as a church to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do that by learning from Christ, living in Christ, and leading others to Christ. Uh, I have a few announcements for the student ministry this week. Number one is we are back to normal schedule in the upper room this week. So we'll be here uh, Wednesday night at six o'clock. We'll have food for you guys. We'll have Bible study, we'll have small groups, and then we're going home. But man, after a wild July, like I'm so excited. Like I haven't preached in like over a month and I'm so excited to get back to it. So man, you guys be here for it. We're asking the question, why not now? All right, I'm not gonna go any further. You gotta be here Wednesday to figure out why we're asking that question. But be here Wednesday night, six o'clock. Also, this Tuesday, if you guys don't have any lunch plans on Tuesday, I will be at Chiquita's from 11 to noon. From 11 to noon, I'll be at Chiquita's for Taco Tuesday. You know, it makes sense. Yeah, Chiquita's Taco, yeah. So this Tuesday, I'll be at Chiquita's from 11 to noon. You guys wanna come hang out? Who knows? I might buy you some tacos, who knows? So. Be there, man, come hang out with me. Give me somebody to hang out with, man. It's gonna be a whole lot of fun, just, you know, kind of casual. And then also, I'm gonna put another little bug in y'all's ear. And I hate that I have to say this, but uh, school starts in like two weeks, all right? Like, I know it's horrible, but guess what? School is starting means we have a back to school event. And that back to school event is gonna be a whole lot of fun. We're inviting churches from uh, youth groups from all over MENA uh, and a couple others even beyond but uh, I'll give you a little teaser. Last year we had water balloons, right? We had over a thousand water balloons. This year we have over 2,000. So uh, it's gonna be a whole lot of fun and that's just one thing we've got planned for you guys. It's gonna be awesome. So invite your friends, it's gonna be a whole lot of fun. And so for the rest of our church announcements, uh, Sunday breakfast will be on August 6th, served by Team 4. So if you are on Team 4 for breakfast, heads up, you, uh, you got breakfast next week. And today we will have a security team meeting after the service. If you are interested in joining or learning more about it, uh, please join that meeting. I don't know, I guess it's gonna be back in one of the classrooms. Mike, yes, no, cool. One of the classrooms for security team meeting. Sure, okay, thumbs up, good to know. All right, so just in one of the classrooms, just hang around for it and they'll, they'll tell you where to go. And then also, if you would like to look at it, the quarterly balance sheet is available on the back tables if you would like to view that information. Man, it's, uh, I'm, I'm out of breath, I'm excited. It's been a long week. It's been a longer week than church camp, but it's been an amazing week, All right? We're coming off the heels of a vacation Bible school this week for our children. It's been a whole lot of fun. If you volunteered uh, for VBS this week, I'm not gonna make you stand up, so calm down. Uh, but I just wanna say thank you, all right? We had over 25 plus kids every single day. It was a whole lot of fun. Uh, the kids that were there, well, at least they told me they had fun, so, uh, so I'll, I'll take that. They made me feel better. But again, if you volunteered for it on Friday, if you helped with water slides and everything, thank you so much for, for the help, for the time you put in this week. Yes, thank y'all. 
thank you for it. You don't understand is how much it means uh, to our children, but also, you know, for me to see a lot of people stepping in to help with these kids, it's super cool to see. And so thank you for that. And kids, again, I hope you guys had fun at VBS because I had a whole lot of fun. All right, so if you would this morning, would you stand with me? We're going to go into a time of prayer, and then we're going to continue to worship our Lord and Savior this morning. Father God, thank you so much, God, for today, for the many blessings you've given us. God, thank you so much for the week that we have had. Thank you for Vacation Bible School, for, um, for the seeds that were planted, Father, for the, for the fruit that I pray uh, comes from VBS, Father. God, I pray for those children that were there, God, that, um, that maybe they heard about you for the first time this past week, God. God, may you grow that seed. May, may they continue to want to grow, to know more about you. And Father, even to have a relationship with you. God, I pray this morning as we come together as a body of believers, God, to sing your praises, to hear your word be spoken. Um, God, would you prepare our hearts as we worship, Father, to hear your word. Be with Bobby as he comes uh, to bring your word, Father. Speak through him. Help us to learn something new that we can apply to our lives and take with us as we go home, as we go to, uh, to practice, to work, wherever we go, Father, that we may have a kingdom impact in everything we do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not a warrior. I'm too afraid to lose. I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to. But Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse, cause broken people are exactly who you use. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. You took a shepherd boy and made him a king. So I'm going to trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror because you fight for me. I'll be a champion claiming your victory. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. A heart like David, Lord, be my defense, so I can face my giants with confidence. I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the walls, won't stop until I see them fall. Gonna stand up, step out when you call, Jesus, Jesus. I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the walls, won't stop until I see them fall. Gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. Yeah, give me faith like Yes, I'll face my giants with confidence. Come, all you weary, come, all you thirsty, come to the Drink of the water 
2 Timothy 4.18 The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
shelter. I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open.
Well, if this is your first week, or in, we are, have started a series a few weeks ago called Ask It, and we're really talking about asking the question that could save you a whole lot of time and a whole lot of difficulty, a whole lot of regret. And really, if you'll just ask this question, it will pretty much answer really about everything. And so if you've been kind of tracking along, you know the question that I'm going to ask you, and it is just simply this. The simple version of this is what? What is the wise thing to do? And nobody really wants to ask that question because, you know, sometimes you don't like the answer to that question because the wise thing to do is not always what you want to do. And we broke this question down a little bit further, and I've been hearing people repeat it to me numerous times throughout the week. And so, and it is this, in light of... My past experience, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, and we're going to talk a little bit more about future hopes and dreams today, what is the wise thing to do? Now, to set this up, I want you to do this. I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them the thing that you regret the most in all of life. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Y'all got to give me that look. Look, there were some of you in your spirit, you just ran out the door. You just went, oh my gosh. I don't want to do that either. And although I do tell stories up here sometimes of things that I regret, but I figured it would be a nice way to kind of break the ice a little bit. And you're like, leave the ice alone. I like it. So, but we won't do that. I won't do that to you. But isn't it interesting that that thing you thought of all of your pulse rate come back down over below 100. You know, we'd like you around somewhere below 100. That thing that you regret, or, 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 those things that you regret, isn't it true that you had this moment where you sat there and you went like this? You went, how could I have been so stupid? Like, that's dumb. How, do, how did I not see that coming? I mean, how did I not know that that guy is a dirt bag? Everybody, I mean, surely, how did I not know that he was going to be an idiot? And I like picking on he's. I don't like to say she's because I'm a he. So, guys, you just get picked on a lot more. But really, you know, how did I know that she was, how did I not see this coming? It's interesting. We ask that question a lot. When we do something dumb, when we kind of have what I call a hand, head in your hands moment where you're going, gosh, I was so stupid. How did I not see that coming? Here's the interesting thing. The interesting thing to me is this. Somebody saw it coming. Just not you. Come on. You can, stop. You can talk in here. It's okay. Somebody saw it coming. When you're going, I didn't see that coming. I have no idea. I cannot believe I did not see that coming. Somebody saw it coming. Now, if you're still living at home with your parents, they see everything coming. And that's one of the sources of friction in your household because they see everything coming. And here's the thing. Here's the thing about I didn't see it coming. The reality of it is this, either you didn't listen to somebody or nobody talked to you about it because they thought you wouldn't listen. Have you ever had that? You see somebody and you see somebody heading down a direction and you go, this is going to end so badly. I would like to say something to them, but they're going to bite my head off. They're going to think I'm judging them, attacking them. And so I'm just not going to say anything. And we'll just kind of let this thing play out. And so what is it that makes us able to see things coming in everybody else's life, but you just can't see it coming in your own life? I stand on the sidelines and on the court side of a lot of games, junior high games and even in college games that I sat on the sidelines for. And here's what I've learned. I have learned that in that environment, when you're a coach, and not, not, I don't stand on the sidelines as a coach, by the way, but anyway, when I'm on the sideline and the emotion is so high, the tension is so high, and they've got to make decisions just like this constantly. Coaches are constantly trying to make decisions because all coaches, hopefully, unless they don't need to be in a business, they want to win. And so in that moment, the emotions are high, and you're hearing, hollering from this side, and you're trying to get your athletes to do the right thing and the 
band's back behind you making a bunch of racket, and the crowd's sitting there cheer cheering on, and you're sitting there going, okay, I want you to go out and try this, and you just send them out, and you hope it works. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but somewhere there is an armed chair coach that knows exactly what the coach ought to do, how he ought to do it, when he ought to do it, how he ought to execute it, and who ought to be doing it all, and they believe that they are 100% correct. And that coach is a blasted idiot for doing what he just did. Or armchair quarterbacks, even though none of us have probably been quarterbacks, or maybe three or four. But isn't it amazing? We can sit and watch and know exactly what everyone ought to do. Why? Because when you're in the middle of a decision, when you're in the middle of friction, when you're in the middle of life, for you, when you're in a relational conflict, you have emotion. And your emotions impair your judgment. Your emotions makes what is, should be obvious not obvious. It changes everything. See, emotions, when emotions, this is the reason why. You know how everybody else ought to raise their kids. You know exactly how they should do everything. I remember when I was a kid, my aunt would come over. She didn't have kids at this time. And she'd walk into mine and my brother's rooms. And she'd tell my mom this. She'd go, you know what, Mary? When I have kids, my kids' rooms will never look like this. Just telling you. I won't settle for that. My kids' rooms will never be this filthy and never smell like this. Three sons later, she had a house that looked like Katrina hit it. You know, I mean, like, it, it looked like Hurricane Katrina had gone through the whole house. And my mom's sitting there like this going, what was that you used to tell me about the kids? And she goes, I just decided it wasn't worth the fight, you know. And so it's like, it's amazing. It's, it's true. You, can t you know what? You can tell everybody else how to spend their money, can't you? You are a great financial advisor for everybody but you because you don't, have a mo you don't have to have that new car that they want so bad. So you could look at them and say, you don't really need that. It's why you're able to look at your kids. You know, they put candy at eye level for kids. Why? Because, you know, they want the kids to buy it. Kids' hands reach out and grab all kinds of stuff. And it's why you as a parent are able to look at that child and go, you don't need that. You got three of those at home. And the kid goes, but I have to have it. You'll live. Come on, let's go. Put that down. Let's go. Don't put it in your pocket. Let's go. Let's go, go, go. It is when there's not emotions involved in your decisions, you can make the right choice. And it is why you are an expert to everybody's life but yours. It is why you know relationally what everybody ought to be doing. You just can't figure it out for you. It's why you know what everybody's marriage ought to look like, but you just can't figure yours out. It's why you know what everybody's finances ought to look like. You just can't figure yours out. So here's the question that we're going to start off our launching pad question. What's the wise thing to do when emotions are high and desires are intense? What's the wise thing to do then? Because anytime there's a big decision for you, it's a job change. Maybe you're moving. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a dating thing. I don't know. A marriage thing. A finance thing. What is the wise thing to do when your emotions are high and your desires, your appetites are inflamed? They're intense. What do we do then? Because our judgment is fogged by our emotions. In other words, you hear people say it this way. You can't see the forest because of the trees. What do you do then? Well, here it is. Listen. Just listen. So you can't build a whole series on wisdom and not talk about the very component that's, the most, that's one of the most important parts of wisdom. If you want to be a wise person, you got to listen. You've got to be able to listen, to not assume that just because somebody comes up to you and says, hey, bro, I love you, but you are heading down the wrong direction. Well, oh, you're just judging me. What are you going to do this time? Just listen. Just don't get all up into your feelings so fast. 
Just listen. Just take a moment and listen. Here's what wise people know. Wise people know when I'm really sad, I need to listen. Wise people know when I'm really mad about something, I need to listen. When I'm really lonely, I need to listen. When I'm overly excited and I just have to have that or I have to have her or I have to have him or I'm not going to make it in life. Wise people know I need to hit the pause button on the remote control of life and listen. Now, the awesome thing is this. There is a guy in the Bible named Solomon. And they tagged him, if you want to throw a hashtag on there, hashtag wisest person who ever lived, parentheses, beside Jesus, okay? I mean, we can't just give him all the credit of being the wisest person ever. But the wisest person ever was named Solomon. He was the third king of Israel, Saul, then David, and David had a son, son named Solomon. We talked a little bit about David last week. And so he has this son, and he's about a teenager, And one day, God goes up to him and says, Solomon, you are about to inherit the kingdom and be the king over everything. Now, you have to keep in mind, when Solomon inherited Israel to become the king of Israel, Israel was the best it's ever been. It was bigger than it's ever been, more powerful than it's ever been. It was, the economy was doing great, great military. And so, Solomon is about to inherit a kingdom to become the king of at a time when it's essentially Israel is at its golden age, the best time ever. And so God says, Solomon, ask and you'll get it. And so Solomon thinks about it and he thought about an Xbox probably. I don't know. Maybe a newer iPhone, one that you know, was a little faster, didn't freeze up. The screen wasn't cracked on. And then he went, you know what? I don't need any of that junk. I want to be wise. God, give me wisdom. I, I, I just, I, I, I want wisdom. That's an extremely wise thing to do. In fact, Solomon's reputation became that he was so wise. In fact, here's what the Bible actually tells us in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 4.29, is that God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands on the seashore. That's a lot of sand, by the way, just so you know. A lot of sand on the seashore. As a teenager, God gave Solomon wisdom. In fact, it goes on and says that verse 31, his fame spread throughout the surrounding nations. Like, people heard about Solomon. People knew about Solomon. And this is before Facebook. This is before TikTok. This is before little short videos. This is before viral videos. People just heard about Solomon. News traveled about Solomon and his his wisdom way before anything could possibly get word out. Verse 34, and kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen, to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. So here's what, here's what this looked like. So if you're a king of a nation somewhere around Israel, you've got a big decision to make. And you're trying to decide, what do I do? What's the wise thing to do? And you're asking this question. Maybe you're even asking this question. You're a big time king and you're going, Lord, in light of my past experiences, current circumstances, and future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing to do? You know what we need to do, guys? We need to make a trip down and talk to Solomon. Because Solomon... Solomon's the wisest man ever. I mean, he's, he's awesome. He knows every, he'll know what to do. We just need to go down and get in line. So what they would do is they'd load up their carts and buggies and horses, and they would head down to meet with Solomon, and they would stand in line. And people sometimes would wait for weeks or even months to get a word from Solomon on what they should do with their big decision. Now, here's the great news for you and I. We don't have to do that. You don't have to get in line and wait for months. You don't have to stand around and look, go talk to... You don't, have to even, you don't have to do that. Because Solomon was nice enough to write it down for us. Solomon actually wrote several books. 
the book of Proverbs that we're going to look at today. Proverbs is an amazing book. Solomon, tradition says, people believe that Solomon actually wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, that's historically inaccurate, but it was written from the persona of Solomon. Like, it, like another person actually wrote it because it didn't come on until after Solomon died. But it was written from the persona of Solomon, as if Solomon were living and, and saying these things. This is a really interesting book of Solomon. And then, then there's another one called the, the Song of of Solomon, or the Song of Songs, depending on how you may would know it. Now, if you're not married, you don't need to read that for your quiet time. You know, we were kids, we'd sneak in there, we'd read a little Song of Solomon and <laughs> laugh, you know, because it's kind of funny, some of the things it says in there. But it's a good book for married people. We'll move on. A lot of wisdom. But then he wrote the book of, of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs has conveniently 31 chapters. I read a book, a chapter of Proverbs a day. And basically, it's a list of one-liners filled with advice. And Solomon wrote, and I, I think that he just wrote it to where we could read a chapter a day of Proverbs. And, and there's not a story, with it. it's just one-liners. Boom, 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 boom. You want to see it here in just a second. We're going to look at, matter of fact, let's look at a few of the things that Solomon actually wrote down. Here it is. So Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Instruct the wise, and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous, and they will learn even more. Remember, a few weeks ago, we talked about a wise person. Who is a wise person? A wise person understands that all of life is connected, that the decisions of today impact us tomorrow. Let's check out this other one. Let the wise listen. There's that word, listen. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive. And a better translation of this word probably is to seek out, to go out after. In modern days in the United States, we might even say to pay for because people pay for consultants and pay for advice. That they receive or seek out Guidance. Now, here's one that's a little bit more of a negative twist on it. Fools think their own way is right. You ever met somebody that just thinks they know everything? Y'all laughing, I know. You met that person that you ever sat there and you said this to them, you went, you just think you know everything, don't you? And they look at you and you go, yeah. And like, they're not being a smart aleck. They just think they do. Like, you just think you're always right, don't you? Yeah, I do. Because they literally, like, they're totally, they're just totally not self-aware. They, they can't think of a time they've ever been wrong. And so when you ask them, you just think you're right about everything. And they go, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much know everything. And you're like, ugh. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise do something. There's that word again. It just keeps showing up. In our conversation, listen, they listen, they listen to others. Another one says, plans go wrong for lack of advice, but many advisors bring success. And when I see this and I think about Solomon, the wisest person who ever walked the planet Earth, I think, man, that's, that's interesting. That's odd to me that Solomon would say, that he needs advisors. And, and the reason it's weird is because God had given him this ability to be wise. It's like this. It would be like somebody who's musically talented. Like, you know these people. They have more talent in their pinky finger than you have in your entire body when it comes to music. Like, they just look at an instrument and they know how to play it. They just pick up the keyboard, you know, and they pick up the guitar, and then they hit the drums, and they just, you know, they hit whatever. If it's an instrument, they just walk up to it and start playing it, and you're sitting there going, I mean, why, how, how, you know, it takes the rest of us 20 years to learn how to do something. You do it in 20 seconds. And it would be like that person walking up to you saying, you know, piano lessons are really important. And you're going, piano lessons? You've never had a music lesson in your entire life. You've never needed it. But Solomon, who's the wisest man ever, his advice is that plans go wrong 
for lack of advice. But many advisors bring success. Solomon knows something that he's trying to teach all of us, and that is this. Don't go at this life alone. Because if you do, you are setting yourself up for failure. You will fail. Here's another one. Here's that word again. Listen to advice and accept discipline. Now, it's not discipline like I'm going to take my belt off and whip you. It's more along the lines of kind of like, you know, you're cruising along with your GPS. You pass the turn because sometimes the GPS is a little delayed. That's what the problem is, I think. And you keep going. I'm going to blame it on the GPS. The GPS is fault. It's not my fault. And so as I'm going along, you know, the GPS says, you need to turn around when it's safe to do so. Well, I'm going to do it when, it's, when there's a cliff right there. No, I'm going to do it when it's safe to do so. Anyhow, so I get irritated at those things. But anyhow, I had to turn around and go back. This, that's kind of what, this is a course correction. That word discipline means course correction. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. There it is. Listen to advice. Accept discipline, and at the end, you will be counted among the wise. Future hopes and dreams, that you will become wise, that you can be counted among the wise. Here's the last one, and I'll, and I'll just I'll quit. Maybe boring you with these. Where there is strife, where there is friction, where there is Tension, child-parent tension, parent-teacher, parent-coach tension, boss and employee tension, husband and wife tension, strife, difficulty, boyfriend, girlfriend tension. There is pride. Now we begin to get down to the root of our problem when it comes to wisdom. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. Here is the unfortunate and sad reality. If you want to read this, you can go back to 1 Kings and read it. Solomon did not take his own advice. The summary of Solomon's life is this. The wisest man who ever lived made the dumbest decisions ever made. When the Bible speaks of Solomon in all of his splendor and glory, It is not a compliment. As Westerners, we compliment Solomon because of all his wealth and splendor. But the Bible and Jesus himself chooses not to do that. And here's why. Because Solomon did not take his own advice. Solomon reached a point of his life where he decided that he knew what's best. I am wise. I know what to do. I don't need anybody's help. I understand everything. I see things coming before they come. And Solomon made the decision not to listen to advice of advisors and people all around him. And he paid. He had the strongest economy of all the countries in that time, and he destroyed it. He had the strongest military of all that time, and he destroyed it. And ultimately, he handed his son Rehoboam a horrible legacy and said, here it is. That ultimately ended in Israel being split. He destroyed, he dismantled something that his dad and heavenly father had built. And he did it by being a fool. He knew the right thing to do. He wrote down the right thing to do. And he chose not to do it. Wisest man ever. Dumbest decisions ever. Because he made a decision that I can go at it alone. Why do we do this? Why do we sabotage our future, our future hopes and dreams? Because we don't want to listen. I'll I'll tell you why. Here's a couple of reasons. Number one is this. We don't seek wisdom because we already know what they're going to tell us. Should I date her? Uh, No. Well, that's not what I want to hear. I'm sorry. Should I buy that? No. You really don't need a $500,000 house on a $50,000 salary. Who cares what anybody else thinks about where you live? We already know what they're going to say. When we were a kid, a lot of times my brother and I, we'd sit there and we'd go, well, I'm going to ask dad. And my brother would go, you know what he's going to say. I'd be like, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to ask him. 
You know, I mean, we already know what they're going to say. We already have an idea. If, to, to see, to ask that question, what is the wise thing to do? You already know the answer. Now listen, let's think about this for a minute. If you already know the wise thing to do, and you choose not to do it, then that makes you a fool. And there's a little bit of fool in all of us. And that's the, that's the, that's the harsh reality of it. There's a little bit of fool in every single one of us. Another reason we don't ask people for advice is this. We don't think it's anybody else's business. It's none of your business. Mind your business. It ain't your business what I, what I do financially. It's none of your business who I date. I mean, who do you think you are? You think you're my mama? It's not your business. We think that it's nobody's business. And so we end up making decisions that sabotage our future. And I'm going to tell you, it all goes back to one word. Here's the one word. Pride. Where there is strife, where there is emotion, where there's tension, where there's difficulty, when there's a big decision to make, because the big decision, especially when it comes to relationships and things like that, when there's big decisions to be made, where there's strife, there is pride. And pride says, I can handle it on my own. I don't need your help. I know what I'm doing. It's my life. And I'm going to do it my way. And ultimately, that decision sabotages your future. You say, I don't need any advice. I'm grown. And I go, but you're 17. There's that. I'm not picking on 17-year-olds. Maybe somebody's 17. They went. But really, I don't need any advice. I already know what to do. There's two things within pride that causes us difficulty in asking people for advice, and that is this. Success is intoxicating and failure is humiliating. Success is intoxicating. Have you ever been in a room with very, very, very successful, especially very, very successful rich people? It's like they walk into the room and their outfit's just a little bit cooler than everybody else who knows why. It may be the same thing. It just looks cooler. And their jokes are just a little bit funnier than everybody else's. They're not really that funny, but you know. You laugh, people laugh a little louder when they talk. People listen a little bit more intently to them. Everything about them is like, they just, they got, I don't know, they just got this look about them. They just walk in and it's like, wow, they're so rich and cool. Everybody wants to gather around them, you know, because they're influential. You know, it's hard to survive that. Th this is the problem Solomon had. The success became intoxicating. I got a pastor friend of mine who, when after he would preach, he would immediately go into his office and lock the door behind him and hide and wait for everybody in the church to leave. And the reason he did it is because people were constantly coming up to him and telling him how wonderful his sermon is. And eventually he started believing it. And eventually he got so prideful and eventually it costed him his job. So when he went to a new church down in Houston, Texas, he said, I will make sure that I insulate myself from being intoxicated by success. Because what happens is this. When everybody starts telling you how wonderful you are, you start believing it. And then you start going, I'm God's gift to the planet. And I don't need any advice. And I know what to do every single time. And I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. Because I'm me. I'm on top of the world. Everybody should come to me and ask me for advice. But what that means is this. I don't need advice. And it's a very dangerous place to be that points to pride. The other thing is failure is humiliating. I think one of the most difficult things, especially for a man, I don't, I don't know what it's like to be a woman, so I can't speak to that, but I can say this. The most difficult thing for a man is to feel inadequate. I can't provide for my family, and I can't provide for my kids. And if there is a failure there, you don't want to talk about it. When your wife slides you a book on that subject, you don't want to read it because it reminds you of inadequacy. It reminds you of failure. And you don't want to talk to anybody about it. You would rather talk about your strengths, the good things that are going on. Man, you're really good at this and this. You don't want to talk 
about your failure. And it's pride. It's the reason you don't want to do it. Because it reminds you of pain. It reminds you of a shortcoming. Here's the thing. This right here will undermine your future. When you ask this question, what is the wise thing to do in light of everything? What's the wise thing to do? When you begin to ask this question, in light of my or yours, our past experience, our current circumstances, future hopes and dreams, future hopes and dreams, what are your future hopes and dreams? Listen. Listen. There's somebody out there that sees it coming. You don't see it coming. But somebody does. And they want to tell you about it. And if they're afraid to tell you about it, because they're afraid of how you're going to respond, work on that. Because pride will sabotage every ounce of success that you have. So based on your current, your current circumstances and your future hopes and dreams, listen. Big decision coming up, job decision, listen. Thinking about dating somebody, listen. Having difficulty or strife with the kids, your marriage, listen. Everybody doesn't need to know your junk. We don't need to turn to each other and tell everybody our greatest regrets. But somebody, somebody needs to know. So listen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you do. We thank you for the word that you've given us. And we thank you for the hope we have in you. And I pray that you will lead us and guide us to just ask it. To just ask in light of our future hopes and dreams, our, to listen, to listen to advice. Help us to guard our hearts and guard our lives from pride. That we may be able to walk wisely with you and honor you in all we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we want to 